Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of How I Built This, Birmingham style. Of course, I'm Ron, CEO and founder of two consumer service brands right here in Birmingham, Alabama, two maids and a mop. And you can see the truck behind me, Pink Zebra Moving. And it's it's a pure joy for me to meet all these entrepreneurs around town. And today we have one that's going to blow your mind. It's one that I think is going to be really fun to hear, real entertaining. We've got Nick Sellers here today with us. Nick is the CEO of the World Games, the World Games that are coming to Birmingham next, next summer in 22. And it's going to transform this city. It's going to make this city a global, uh, lo uh, global location that uh, people can look to the city in other ways than the things that you know, a lot of people think about when they think about Birmingham. There's been so much that has occurred over the last several years with the World Games and Nick's been in front of all of those things. So Nick, before he even came to Birmingham, ran the uh, Mobile Division of Alabama Power. He was the former director of the Alabama Sports Council and he's the chairman of uh, the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame as well. And so Nick is well established in the state of Alabama. And uh, I am so honored um, and excited to have a chance to talk to Nick today and hear all about the World Games and all the stuff going on behind the scenes. So Nick, welcome to our podcast. Hey, thank you for having me, Ron. It's great to be with you. One small edit, because this is just, it's important. I'm a, a, an emeritus board member of the Sports Hall of Fame. Our chairman is Edgar Weldon, and he actually played a very significant role in these, in landing the World Games. So we'll talk about that, I know. Absolutely. So that that's one thing I really am interested. Uh, this is when we're recording this, this is uh, right in the middle of the Summer Olympics in, in Tokyo. And so yeah. there's a lot of uh, a lot of international sports uh, going on right now. And I'm sure you're trying to, you know, following all the ins and outs of all that good stuff. But I want to kind of take us back to years ago, even before you kind of came on board and, and talk about what the World Games are and, and how the city of Birmingham thought that they would even be, you know, in the same uh, room uh, with all the other international cities to be able to make a bid, much less win the bid. You know, so I, I, I know you weren't necessarily here during those early days, but I'd love to hear some of those early stories of how it all evolved. Yeah, I'll give you a little background on the World Games first, because if, if you're like me, you, you've heard that something big's coming um, and you've heard about these World Games and it's got a really cool name, but you're like, I have no idea. I mean, what is this like Olympic style stuff? What is it? And the answer is it is absolutely Olympic style. Um, so there's a little over 100 Nash, international federations of sport, Ron, that compete inside the International Olympic Committee family. The movement is what they call it. You've heard of the Olympic movement. And of those 100 plus fed, uh, international mm -hmm. federations, about 24 of them actually compete on the official Olympic plat summer Olympic platform. Um, and then the Olympic Committee, the host committee, Tokyo this time, they have an opportunity to invite a few other invitational sports that are kind of emerging or popular sports in their country, but are part of the Olympic movement family, okay? Uh, the World Games operates under the patronage of the International Olympic Committee. So we're all interdependent on the Olympic movement. And we have 34 sports on our platform, many of which, in fact, there are six sports or sports disciplines that are competing in Tokyo in these Summer Olympics. Those same athletes will be competing right here next year. So the World Games has been around for 40 years. It follows the Summer Olympics by one year and has since 1981, since its inception. It's been all over the world. First time back in the U.S. since it was founded in Santa Clara, California in 1981. And so I would define the World Games sports as the new generation of sports, Ron. These are emerging, fast-growing sports around the world that are part of the Olympic platform and ultimately are either invitational sports to the official Olympic platform or they will ultimately be full Olympic sports. For instance, lacrosse is the last time that we will probably see lacrosse in the World Games will be in Birmingham in 2022. It was just voted as a full Olympic sports partner. And so lacrosse, because as we know, is one of the fastest growing sports in the world, will be in the Summer Olympics in LA 2028 and probably before that. Um, so again, the World Games are under the patronage of the International Olympic Committee. We share some of those sports. But I would define the World Games as sort of the new generation of those uh, of international sports. Uh, they really appeal to the 18 to 35 demographic, whereas the traditional sports we see in the Olympics kind of appeal to, you know, probably guys more like me and you. But, uh, you know, I, I want to see some of the cool sports like drone racing and some of the other things we're going to see in the World Games. But then there's sports that we all know and love, like Muay Thai and kickboxing and sumo and uh, some really cool stuff that we'll showcase. 
Yeah, I've, I've been reading about some of those sports and, and how interesting some of them are. Some are very traditional, like softball. You know, the, even, yeah. even some local people from the state of Alabama are on that softball team. And, I, you know, I guess we'll see what it looks like next year. But it sounds like some of those folks are going to come home to play in Birmingham next year. Well, so. man, when you talk about softball, that's a uh, there's a huge storyline there, Ron. Um, as you mentioned, first, the U.S. team, the U.S. ladies team just lost to Japan in the gold medal round yesterday morning. It was a sort of a devastating uh, two to one loss. And um, it was a rematch from the Beijing Olympics where we had lost. So we're 0-2, um, but we have beat them in the world championships before. And the U.S. and the women's uh, uh, Japan team are kind of the, they're the top two, man. I mean, they're they're the Rocky and the Ivan Drago of, of right. softball, okay? Um, or more like a follow greed, I guess. But then we will be uh, so both of those teams will be part of the top eight teams in the world that have already qualified to compete in the world games in 2022. Um, and this will be the last time that we will be able to see international softball at this level on American soil, probably until L.A. of 2028. And you're right. Haley McClenney, she's a four time All-American from the University of Alabama. She went to Mortimer Jordan High School right up the road in Jefferson County in North Jefferson County. She's a Blue Devil. And she's the first native Alabamian in history, man, to be on the U.S. women's team. She's a team captain, center fielder, played lights out in Tokyo. And so this is going to be a huge grudge match. This is a chance for the U.S. women's team to, um, you know, to finally win a gold medal round and to avenge two Olympic losses. And I think it's going to be a huge sellout. Tickets are already going fast for that one. So, so, and, and that's exciting. I mean, it's going to be so cool. Should, I can't imagine the kind of crowds we're going to have just to cheer on her, you know, yeah. it's going to be a lot of fun, but there's some kind of interesting ones too. I mean, we talked a little bit offline about some of these uh, and uh, there's 34 sports altogether in the games, right? Uh, can you tell us about one of the, some of the more interesting ones that maybe folks here in Alabama have never heard of? Yeah. Well, you know, th there's a lot of sports first that, that they have, and we'll market the heck out of those because, as I mentioned, the martial arts sports from Muay Thai to kickboxing to men's and women's sumo, uh, karate. In fact, karate was on the Olympic platform in Tokyo. Those same athletes, many of those same ones will be competing right here at Batwell Auditorium. No, that will be at Birmingham Southern next year. Um, and then there's sports that we know and love, like I mentioned, lacrosse, like softball, like um, water ski jumping and wakeboarding. That'll be at Oak Mountain. Um, there's a duathlon that'll run and bike through the, uh, the whole city and, and uh, the downtown area that'll be huge. Um, but then, as you mentioned, there's these emerging sports that folks might have not heard as much about parkour, man. That's uh, our, your kids and our kids, my kids, they know about it. I mean, these are these athletes that are jumping off of walls and cars and mm -hmm. we will build a parkour obstacle course at Sloss Furnaces right next to a beach handball court. That's where the party zone is going to be. Um, I mean, that's going to be a cool deal. In fact, indoor handball is in Tokyo. It's always more fun at the beach, man. And we're going to have beach handball at Sloss Furnaces. And these athletes are, are really incredible to watch. Um, so that, that's an emerging sport. Um, another big sport that's kind of emerging, uh, I mentioned it earlier, is in these both, both of these sports will be at Barber Motorsports Park, which is an international jewel, as you know. And that's drone racing. And there's a pro drone racing league you got to check that out. Just Google drone racing when folks are done watching this podcast and watch these unbelievable, I mean, uh, these drones that are moving through LED lights in major stadiums all over the world. That is so cool. And it is cool. And, and the other that will be out there, Ron, is canopy piloting. I'd never heard of it, but it is, uh, it's an extreme sport. So these athletes jump out of helicopters at Barber Motorsports Park. They'll pop a parachute about a thousand feet before the ground. They've got to drag a foot across a water runway obstacle course that we build. And then they will land at a precision point at the tail end of that. And it's real fast paced, high energy. We'll have a lot of music and live bands playing. And when they miss, it's interesting. So it's going to be a high energy deal out there, man. Uh, man, I can't those, wait. <laughs> yeah, those are just some, of the, just some of the cool ones. The other cool one that, that's really neat, I think people will want to see, is a sport called porfball. I define that as a uh, 21st century basketball. It's the, it's the largest sport in the Netherlands. It's 11 foot rims instead of 10 foot rims and they're smaller uh, and it's co-ed and there's no passing the ball. It's sort of the size of a soccer ball. You, you can only, I mean, there's no dribbling the ball. You can only pass it and you can shoot from anywhere. Um, so that, I think that's going to be just a really cool sport to watch. Absolutely. Well, man, I'm ready. Let's go. Yeah. Hurry up and get here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, let's talk a little bit about business. You know, the, a lot of the folks that are, are watching this are very entrepreneurial um, minded, you know, whether they started a business or want to start a business, that's what they're here for, to, to learn and be inspired. And I can't think of anything more inspiring for the city of Birmingham other than this. You know, the, there's an entire organization built around all these fun, entertaining games. And it involves people, everything from vendors to staff members to even volunteers, and of course, the athletes. Um, I can't imagine, you know, all the ins and outs that's required to manage all of that. Um, but I'm going to try to dig as deep as I can here. And so, you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective, you know, how, you know, how exciting is it to be able to lead something like this? Like you said, it's never been in the States, you know, since it's, it's since its early days in the early 80s in California. Uh, to bring that back to not, you know, just Birmingham, but to, but to the U.S. has got to be a, a huge honor. What, what's a day in the life like? You know, what do you, what do you do every day to sort of make this happen? Man, I, I felt like I caught the bus on this one, Ron. When, when our CEO uh, of Alabama Power, Mark Crosswhite, called me and asked me to come visit with him, the chairman of the Birmingham Organizing Committee Board has been a teammate of mine for our 20 years at the power company. His name is Jonathan Porter. He's a wonderful guy and a, and a great leader at, at Alabama Power and a real rising star in our company. And so they knew I had a sports background. I wanted to get back to Birmingham. And they said, look, we, we're investing significant dollars in these games. And um, there's going to be a change at the leadership position. We've had a really good guy that's got us to this point. But we need someone who's kind of got some more established relationships in the community. Why don't you come back and, and take it on? And so there was a small team in place and it was still a ways out. Um, but I had no idea what I had, what I got myself into. And I, it's been an unbelievable blessing. I'm really grateful for it. But gosh, I started in December of 2019 um, and came in to kind of get an assessment of where we were and where we were going. You talked about the bid earlier, Edgar Weldon, who was a prominent businessman in, in Alabama. He lives in Birmingham. Uh, again, just a wonderful guy who's given so much of his life's work to helping to make Alabama better and the business community better. He's the chairman of the board of the Sports Hall of Fame. He was part of a team that bid to, to win this. Scott Myers is the president of the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame. He helped lead that effort with a guy named David Bank, who's a senior executive and general counsel at Hibbit um, Sports um, here, now at Hibbit City Gear. And we competed against many countries. It finally came down to three finalists, and it was Lima, Peru, Ufa, Russia, and Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> Uh, or really Birmingham, USA is how we define it because it's really the city and the country. Um, and we won. Um, we didn't have the, the, the highest bid. We bid in the mid 70 millions. In fact, our budget today has is, is been through a lot of efficiencies and, and in kind and other things is down now into the, kind of the mid 50 million range. And, they, and, and Russia was over 100 million uh, for this, but we won because the World Games wanted to get back into the US. They understand how crazy the sport Southeast fans are for sports. Um, and they saw this as a great market to bring the largest international multi-sport event in the Southeast U.S. since the 1996 Olympics. So it was a big victory for us, man. And in the day in the life, you know, first and foremost, is just wrapping your head around this investment. And what is it that the host committee has to do interacting with all of these international governing bodies and the International World Games Association and the International Olympic Committee to pull this thing off? We just decided early on we needed to be very clear on our mission and, and what that is. Um, and, and that's to help, help reintroduce Birmingham and the state of Alabama in a very special way on a global platform to the world as this new medical capital of the South with all kinds of innovation going on. And I tell people all the time, to the extent folks around the world think about Birmingham, they probably think about us in black and white, Ron. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not just talking about race, man. I'm talking about TV here. <laughs> you know, this is a chance for them to think about, to see this new emerging city that's finally getting comfortable in our skin, that's finally recognizing there's more that brings us together than pulls us apart, that has great success stories like SHIP. We talked about Bill Smith earlier and, and other innovative companies that are starting to really establish themselves, uh, you know, as global players. And we chased Atlanta, we chased Nashville, we chased all these cities forever. I was part of it, man. I was part of a group 20 years ago that wanted to build a dome stadium and, and pass a campaign called MAPS. And we finally realized we don't want to be Atlanta. We want to be the best Birmingham that we can be. And this is a really dang cool place to live and work and play. And, and I think it's one of the best kept secrets. 
And we're going to get a chance to, to showcase that on global television through the Olympic Channel and all, through our partnership with CBS and CBS Sports, two one-hour specials during prime time for CBS Network and 120 million households, 10 hours on CBS Sports. We had to negotiate that deal. So this whole notion of what is a day in the life of, we have 10 different venue clusters across the metropolitan area. So we had to recruit an unbelievable operations team that had relationships with all of these venues, go as far south as, as Oak Mountain and the Hoover Met as far east as Barber Motorsports, as far west as across Plex. And then most of that other stuff is in the city proper downtown. Um, the, the transportation, the safety, I'm actually in Washington, D.C. right now. I mentioned earlier, we're meeting with our congressional delegation, we're meeting with Homeland Security and with Secret Service and the FBI. This will be designated a SEER 1 level security rating. I'm sort of breaking that on your podcast. It's not public yet, but it's that's a Super Bowl level. We've never had that in Alabama. And that's a good thing. That means that we will have unified command with our federal government and resources, along with city of Birmingham, Jefferson County, our state homeland security. But suffice to say, man, with over 100 countries competing and 3,600 athletes, we want this to be the safest and easiest event to get around in the history of the World Games and in international sports. And so there's a lot that goes into all of those logistics and planning. The marketing of this thing, you know, there the, the doesn't have a ton of name ID. The connectivity to the Olympics is weak. And so we've got to spend real money to do that. How do you do that? We went out and we've engaged several really good partners. One is a firm called Bruno Event Team. They're a local firm. A guy named Gene Hallman has run that for many, many years uh, with Ronnie Bruno, who was part of the Bruno grocery family. And they are underpinning part of our operations and our marketing. We've hired a firm out of New York. I had to go find uh, who's, who's the firm who really knows digital and, and social and, and creative content and platforms. I don't know much about that. I'm, I'm trying to be a part of the company that keeps the lights on every day, you know, but this is a, was a different world. So we've, we found one of the best in the business, a firm called Team Whistle. And Team Whistle was just acquired by uh, a huge outfit called Eleven Sports. They're a global outfit. Um, and they're going to be doing great. They own uh, and, do, and do all kinds of creative content platforms from um, uh, Dude Perfect, you know, the guys who do all the fancy shots right. and creative shots. My kids do, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, really, it's, it's the TikTok world. Like, how do we engage these young kids and get them excited? And, and, and so uh, we've hired this firm to help us do that. We've hired a PR firm out of D.C. and out of Atlanta to help us really get the message outside of the Southeast even. We think the majority of our 500,000, half a million-ish fans that will come for this 11-day event will come from generally the super Southeast. And so we've got a market there. I don't have, we don't have the budget. We got about a $3 million ad budget, um, which you, you know, you would think, golly, you, I'd, I'd expect you to have a five or 10 million. I mean, it's, you know, so much of our budget has got to go into the operations of this deal. Um, and so how do I get that message out? We're doing linear broadcast networks. We're advertising in, in Alabama. We're doing outdoor, but most of our money is going to go in digital. It's going to be very calculated, finding the softball families, the, 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 the sport families that care about these sports. And we are on all of their social media feeds, man. So it's just putting all that together. And then you got to, we got to, we had to raise, you know, it's a $55 million endeavor. About 35 to 40 of that has got to come from, you know, we had to apportion that early on um, from the private sector and sponsorships. We've sold almost 43, 44 sponsors, um, 30 plus million in cash and in-kind sponsorships. And that was a huge deal is where are we, where will our funds come from to, to do this um, deal? It all comes down to governance, man. Like any startup, you got to put together a bang up board. You got to have really good governance in the committees of those boards. You have to have active board members that help you and inform the conversation and help uh, lay the strategy. And then we got to hire a great team and hold them accountable to execute on the plan. It, it was, so I'm a nerd when it comes to all the things you just talked about, operations, marketing, you know, service and support, all these things that you're living in, you know, living on a daily basis right now. What's so cool to me is at some point many years ago, this was an idea in someone's living room. <laughs> like it's just wow. a few, just a few folks here in Birmingham that really love the city and, and wanted to, to leave a legacy behind and a mark. And that idea 
was born and all these other things come you know behind it and so it's so cool you know that's what i love about this this country is that you can literally sit across the table from some you know someone and dream and that dream can become reality and so that's that's what we're seeing happen right in front of our faces right now with the world games um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that nobody likes to talk about, some of the mistakes, you know, because no, when you watch Shark Tank, everybody makes all this money and then everybody assumes they go and become multi-billionaires and, you know, live, into, live on Mars. But, you know, no, no one recognizes all the, all the pitfalls, all the mistakes, you know, my, my favorite guy, Warren Buffett's made a few himself, but nobody ever t talks about those things. So let's talk about those things. <laughs> Um, as painful as they might be, because I think it's important for someone else out there that's listening who says, hey, I have an idea. I want to make some magic one day. Um, am I supposed to be perfect? You know, is it okay to make mistakes? And what do I do when I make them? You know, so what, what were some of those early uh, mistakes that were made, um, not necessarily directly by you, but by the organization? And what can be learned from that so that someone else that's building, whether it's a small business or a large enterprise, they can, they can do something with that information? Yeah, that's such a great question. And it is something that we constantly try to calibrate on as a team. Um, and anybody who is recognizes what it takes to put together a startup business um, un certainly understands and appreciates it. And if you haven't, just Google the Michael Jordan commercial, the famous commercial about failure, because he, in 30 seconds, just nails it. I have yeah. failed over and over and over again, and that is why I succeed. Um, and, and we, we constantly are stubbing our toe. I mean, we, you know, we, we've never done anything like this in this community before. So I, we, we had some early mistakes that probably set us back a little bit. Um, and, and I would say one of the early ones was we did not create the connectivity to the Olympic rings. We had the ability to do so, but we really started out kind of marketing the uniqueness of these games, you know, and if you don't have the right strategy in place or if you're kind of shooting and you're not really sure where you're shooting at, it's hard to know if you're hitting it. And um, we, we didn't have a very well-defined marketing strategy and, and, and it sort of diluted the world games. People started to think, man, these sound like it's kind of a glorified field day. I mean, what is this thing? You know, you got all these unique, interesting sports. I don't want to know if I want to go see that stuff. When in reality, a lot of these sports are competing on the Olympic platform. And, and a lot of these sports are the fastest growing spectator sports in the world. And so we needed to really create that connectivity. We, we missed the mark on that for probably six to eight months before we hired a new firm that worked with Bruno event team and helped us refine the messaging around, around that too. And, and you know, Sometimes it takes focus groups and polling and things like that to really refine uh, what, what it is you're trying to achieve when you know what your product is and, and you, you really got to understand the market you're trying to sell that product into. Um, and then you got to understand who are the competitors in that market that can uh, you're trying to take market share from or you're trying to ensure they don't take your market share. Well, in this instance, this was not an established um, property. I mean, the World Games is, you know, we're trying to take market or at least get people to come in, in lieu of doing something else next summer and recognize that this is a huge event and a can't miss event for Birmingham and for the state. And so we had to find out what, what are the summer fests doing? What are the other multi-sport events doing? Who are we competing with? We had some mistakes around that early on. Another one was we put all our eggs in this basket with NBC sports. Um, there was sort of a handshake deal with, with a wonderful guy named Peter Diamond, who's a Emmy Award winning producer for NBC Sports coming out of Poland. Hey, don't worry. We're going to give you 10 hours on NBC Sports. It's going to be all good because you, you got to have a domestic broadcast partner when you're putting on these games. And the international broadcast partner is ISB, International Sports Broadcast, which is part of the Olympics. And they handle all the international properties and negotiate all those rights. So we just said, we're good. We'll, we'll, we'll let that lie. And then the pandemic hit. You know, it was kind of all bets are off. And there was a ton of learning from that, Ron. But one of them was when we got a call from Peter Diamond, he said, hey, I know I told you don't worry about it. I know I told you, you know, we don't have a need to contract right now. And I know I told you that if you were out trying to find another dance partner, that we were going to be out. You just had to trust us. You know, he gave us the old George Costanza. It's not you, it's me. Um, <laughs> because then the next thing he said was, this pandemic has turned everything up the upside down. I can't commit to 10 hours on NBC sports anymore. In fact, I can't even tell you 
about NBC Sports. We got a lot of stuff happening. And as we all know now, NBC Sports, as it used to be, is going away. Uh, Peacock and streaming and all these things are just really quickly evolving. And I didn't know that landscape well. And so we made a mistake in not getting things under contract. And if you get, think you got a deal, I know everybody wants to say, man, a handshake and a not, you, you, if in the business, you got to make sure you commit some stuff to four corners of paper. Um, and, and we didn't do that. And so we were left kind of holding the bag with no dance partner. And I had to go find someone to help us negotiate a deal. We'd never negotiated a media rights deal. So we found Wasserman Media um, through Edgar Weldon, who had some relationships. Gosh, Edgar's nephew or Edgar's niece is dating an executive with Wasserman Media. So we get introduced. Casey Wasserman is the president and CEO of LA 2028 Organizing Committee for the next time the Olympics is in, um, is in the U.S., Washington Media is a global outfit. They negotiate these media deals all the time and media properties. And we hired them to negotiate with the big four, CBS, Fox, ABC, and go back to NBC and then ESPN and others. And we ultimately got down to Fox and CBS. And we, we did a deal with, with CBS where, you know, but I, we finally got it done literally about a month ago. And that put us behind. That was that was a mistake. But we, we finally got our sea legs on that one. And, and that's going to help us sell more sponsorship. That's just yes. a few of our mistakes, man. What, what I heard in that, I heard a lot of awesome things. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot of stress and, and, and concern there, of course. But, um, you know, you talked about you, you, handshakes are great. And sometimes you can get away with that. But sometimes you can't. And when you can't, it really it, it kills a lot of things. And so a um, piece of paper that goes a long way. So I, I, I agree with you there. We, we're in the franchise space. So that's, that's all we know is pieces of paper, you know? So um, the other side of that is, I mean, it sounded like a crazy story, you know, but this relationship that was way out there, it sounds like almost a tertiary relationship with someone's daughter's boyfriend, you know, but um, all those little things that seem very insignificant can can become something pretty significant down the road. And that's happened to me in my life. I can, I can't tell you how many times, where I've had a, um, I mean, we just talked about it beforehand, some, some mutual friends and just some chance encounters that turned into relationships that end up in the business opportunity behind it. And so um, I think that if you're having a coffee or if you're having a meeting or if you're just playing golf or going to the world games, um, you're always on the stage, you know? And so you, you never know, obviously don't use this potential friendship for just economic purposes, but relationships can go a long way and, and whether you're an introvert or an extrovert you, there's no reason why you can't why you can't get to know people and uh, it, the more I meet people around this city the, the, the better it is for my business it's just that it's you know plain and simple and so it's not and that's not the intent you know, but that usually is, is sort of how it goes down yeah. um, so I, I got to ask a couple of questions you talked about COVID um, you came in just a few months prior to the emergence of, uh, of the pandemic and, you know, obviously are, have lived through all that and what we're still going through today. And so the games have been postponed by a year. Uh, part of that, I think, was because of the Olympics also being postponed, but obviously that was because of, of COVID. Um, what has that been like? I mean, that, that, I, I mean, you could probably write a book on that, but what, what's, what has that been like just managing all the unknown uh, through all this time you know it's been uh we could we could write a book it's been crazy that this this committee right now is uh, that we have the staff team is kind of an amalgamation of um several different types of players we have con contracted teammates from event management and pr and marketing and the like um we have on loaned executives so our cfo is on loan from regions bank our uh, chief marketing officer is, uh, is on loan from uh, Coca-Cola and much like a startup, she's a board member and she's an on loan chief marketing officer for us because she just got great energy and strategic thought. Pam Cook is her name. Um, our head of logistics is on loan from Altec Industries, where he's been a logistics you know, kind of senior leader there for, for many years, Rick Edwards. Um, and, and when you put all of those teammates together, um, you, you get a lot of great you got to have diversity in everything, as you know, when you, when you want to get to, to a good uh, answer and a good strategy. Um, and, I, and I think we've put together a heck of a team around that, but nothing could have planned for this pandemic. When it happened, our first order of business was um, 
can we still have this thing? And so much of that was in flux. And we there was cancellation insurance um, that we had. Thankfully, we had a you know I want to say it was an all in like a forty plus million dollar uh, policy if we had to cancel it, but we postponed it. But the the but the policy uh, did allow for paying us for for some of the time that we didn't plan. So this year delay, and we've had to file a claim on all that to to try to get get that done. But once it the Tokyo Olympics said we're moving a year. All of these, all of these big events from the World Track and Field Championships, which is in Oregon next year, to us, to the Commonwealth Games, which is in Europe and the Commonwealth countries, everything cascaded, and it was this wild west mad dash to find a new date to follow the Olympics. And so everybody was scrambling, uh, and and that was insane. And we decided, we went to the city leaders and said, "Do we want to do this, or just can't we?" You know cancel it and call it a day and we we all said no this is let's do this it's going to be important for our country uh frankly coming out of this pandemic to have a great reconnection and we believe that uh, we would be there by then and i still believe we will be there by then if we get everybody to you know be smart about this thing um and and so the when we did that um we literally everybody was remote everything was was zoom became a thing as we all know so fast Right. And and the whole world. I mean, what do we do with the office? How do we operate day in and day out? What about our sponsorships? We had to call everybody that was our existing sponsor and just say, hey, can you stay with us? Can you still, you know, we're, we're going to do this thing. Um, and and because that was keeping our doors open, you know, um, we had to we had to talk to sponsors. We had been pitching and saying, look, I know we know you've got to focus just on your operations and your business right now. But we want to get back with you as soon as things start to settle down um, because we're, we're going to light this candle at some point. We're going to do this. We've got a date we're going to announce soon in 2022, and we need you to, to consider being a part of it. So it was a lot of uncertainty for probably eight months, eight to 10 months about how we do this. And then coming out of it, man, I just I think that there's so many great storylines about what this event's going to mean as a major reconnection of our community and our, our region of our country and, and frankly, our country to our world as the first major international multi-sport event coming out of the, coming out of the, uh, the pandemic, um, uh, with full venues again, we believe that, but it was, a it was nip and tuck for a while. And, and I'd be lying if I told you that I had full confidence we were going to do this, you know, last summer. Um, we, we, it, it really was about this time last summer that we said, we know we can do it. We've got a date that we've renegotiated all of our venue contracts and deals for uh, all over the city that was a massive undertaking to do and it was we were working you know 15 hour days um for weeks on end to try to get get back on steady ground again to get where we are well i can tell you this from one birmingham native to another um, i'm proud of what you guys have built i'm proud to to be uh, a member of the community and um, I'm extremely excited about what's coming to town in a year from now. And I, I know everyone listening to this is as well. Uh, there's so much to learn from this story, you know, from, from the idea generation to the execution, you know, all, to all of the pivoting that had to occur along the way. There's just, you, you're, hopefully there will be a book about this one day because it, it, it's proof to me that this city is as entrepreneurial as it gets. And you talk about the chase to be like uh, Birmingham or, or Atlanta or Nashville or whatever. Um, you know, we're putting a stamp on this city as as our own as our own city, and I'm excited to see what the games do for the, the economy, but also what it does for our community as well in terms of just uh, national and global awareness. And so you're you're uh, you're the man behind the but the scenes pushing all that, and I know that you sort of took a break from your you know other life to to, to pursue this. And so thank you for the dedication that you've 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 uh, provided the city. So um, for everyone out there that's, that's listening, you know, I'd love for them to have an opportunity to learn more about the games, learn more about you. What, what can they do to connect with you or learn more about these games? Thanks very much, Ron. I would too. Uh, we, we're going to need over 2,000 volunteers. We, we need the best talent that our great city has to offer to come together and put our best foot forward for the world. So um, to learn more about it, if you just want to go, if you just want to be a spectator, TWG2022.com. Tickets are on sale for this. We, we call it once in a lifetime. It really is uh, going to be a once in a lifetime moment for our community. I think it will be a step change in, in our city's history. Um, and, and then secondly, if you want to engage with us to, as either your business for a partnership, we'll spend upwards of 12, $14 million um, with contractors and with the businesses 
And we're really trying to work on small local women and minority owned businesses as well um, here. And if you're an entrepreneur and you want to, you know, get involved, we have this thing called the world of opportunity and you can go to our website and find out how to get involved there or just reach out to me directly. My email is very easy. It's Nick N I C K dot sellers, S E L L E R S at T W G 2022.com. Um, that's what we're trying to do is to bring people together, create more capacity in our community so that we can prove to the world we are capable of doing this. And look, you can't get, just like in any relationship, you cannot get somebody else to love you unless you really care about yourself and you feel good about yourself. This is as much about us recognizing. This is our Stuart Smiley moment, man. We're good enough, we're smart enough, and doggone people like us. And this is our moment to recognize we can do big things in this community. Oh, man, you got me motivated and excited. Go Birmingham. Uh, I can't wait for the games. It's going to be a lot of fun. When you hear that guy yelling at the beach volleyball game, remember this interview and uh, don't kick me out. So it's going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be there. So that's the deal. Nate, Nick, thanks for your time and uh, thanks for your dedication for this city as well. We'll thanks, talk brother. later. Thank you for having me, Ron. You bet.